Hopefully by now you know that I am going over to the dark side and training to be an air source heat pump engineer and I am actually doing the training for free because Tomcat have teamed up with Hybrid Technical Services to bring this air source heat pump course absolutely free to plumbers gas engineers and heat and vent engineers if they're sole traders. Now if you work for a company or you're a director of a limited company then you have to pay a small contribution. Anyway, what I've decided to do is while I'm doing my training is show you exactly what we've been learning. Now in the first Wednesday video I did I talked about air to water heat pumps and if you haven't seen that video I will put a link in the description below now the video we're going to be looking at today is we're going to look at a ground source heat pump to water because they also do a ground source heat pump to air but we're not going to look at that one we're going to look at the water first so let's get on with it and find out exactly how a ground source heat pump to water works so let's start by looking at the place where the heat is gained from and that is as it says on the tin from the ground ground source heat pumps so there is a kind of a constant temperature in the ground which is round about 1 to 1.2 meters down and in our area where i live it's bang on 10 degrees now i know that because when I worked on maintenance at a sewing thread manufacturers, we used to produce our own water. The tap water wasn't good enough. We used boreholes. And all year round, the water that was produced from the boreholes was always bang on 10 degrees. But this temperature in the ground, depending on where you live, can range, in, well that's in the UK, can range between 8 and 12 degrees. So there is a constant heat there we can get out of the ground. So how do we do it? Well, basically, we do it by a series of pipework laid in the ground, or they call them pipe arrays. Now, these can be laid horizontal. They can also be vertical, or like I said before, they could be boreholes. So there's different ways of doing the pipework. There's even one called a slinky, where it's where they overlap the pipework in the trench. Anyway, this pipework they're using is PE100 polyethylene pipe, or high density polyethylene. And they can either join them by mechanical fittings or fusion welding. And it's always advised, if you do have to join the pipes, to use fusion welding in a ground source heat pump because a mechanical joint could actually break and you wouldn't want that because you would have the glycol coming out but they do sell these in 100 meters to 400 meter rolls so there is a chance you will actually need to put a joint in the pipework now I'm showing this array just going round like you would do with a, an underfloor heating pipe. Now a massive downfall for this heating system is the size of the back garden you're going to need. Now if you've got a terraced house here in the middle of Ashton, you're not going to have enough room to put one of these in. And you won't be able to do a bore roll neither. So the ground source heat pump in the middle of a, a town or a city is probably not going to be a good idea. You're probably not going to get planning permission for it because the area you need for the pipe arrays is about two to two and a half times bigger than your house so the area of your house so it's a massive area you might need you've got to bear that in mind how do we get that heat out there now because we've got glycol going through this pipe work which is about 30 percent glycol to 70 percent water it then is pumped around the ground where it absorbs this heat and it takes it back to the evaporator or the plate to plate heat exchanger inside the property. Now this flow and return pipe going to the arrays will need to be insulated 
because if you don't insulate them you could have heat loss coming through the return pipe where it returns the heat back to the plate to plate heat exchanger but you could also freeze the ground on this flow pipe going back to the arrays because water starts to freeze at 4 degrees and if you've only got 10 degrees in the ground any moisture in that ground if you start taking that heat lower than 4 degrees it's going to start freezing and this could be another problem of freezing the ground if you've got a neighbour who's also got a system like this you could end up freezing a, a field same with boreholes, if you've got borehole in the ground, that borehole is drawing the heat out of the ground. Because the way this heat gets in the ground is from the sun. It's from solar, and also the rain can also add heat, believe it or not, into the ground. This is not geothermal. Geothermal is when you've got the volcanic uh, rock which is hot, warming water in the ground. Like you get in is it Iceland, where they have these very hot springs. That's geothermal. This isn't. This is coming from solar. This is from the sun. So the sun is heating the ground. And the ground is like a gigantic battery. And it holds that heat in the ground. About 40% of the heat given from the sun is absorbed in the ground. So it's a huge battery, but if you take that heat out too quickly, we're going to be freezing the ground. So we've got to be really careful what we're doing when these are installed. So once this antifreeze water gets back to the plate to plate heat exchanger or the evaporator, it kind of then is the same system as what we looked at when we looked at the air source heat pump. So this section here is pretty much the same as an air source heat pump. Now this glycol has got to this plate to plate heat exchanger or the evaporator, it transfers its heat into the refrigerant. Now in my last video on Wednesday, I was uh, kind of telling you about the old refrigerant, what's in there. And I've been told by Mike Teal from Daikin and Paul Turner from Worcester that we're now using R32 and R290 refrigerant. Now R32 has a boiling point of minus 52 degrees centigrade and R290 is about 42, minus 42 degrees centigrade. So that's the boiling points. So what they can do is, because they've got a very low boiling point, we can transfer that heat, which is basically a low pressure, low temperature heat. But what it does is, because it is low temperature, it will still boil the refrigerant. And it turns the refrigerant from a liquid into a vapour. So this vapour then goes along to the compressor. In the compressor, the low pressure of the low temperature refrigerant vapour from the evaporator is raised to the pressure that is significantly higher to match desired condensing temperature in the condenser. During compression, not only the pressure, but also the temperature of the refrigerant will increase. Once it's left this compressor, it then goes through to another plate to plate heat exchanger or the condenser where the heat then is transferred back into glycol which will then go to your cylinder your underfloor heating or your radiators to heat your home and your hot water now this heat has been taken out we've now gone to a high pressure liquid which is cooler which then needs to go through the filter dryer Filter dryers are usually installed in a liquid line of a dry expansion refrigerant system where they have a dual function. First, they trap coarse particles, contamination and copper shavings and second, they capture any moisture present in the system. Now it's past the filter dryer, we need to go through a sight glass. 
sight glass is normally installed in the liquid line directly after the filter dryer in the system with an expansion valve after it. The sight glass can be installed anywhere along the pipe run in the liquid line, however positioning close to the expansion valve is always advisable. Now the last thing it's going to do is go through the expansion valve which turns the refrigerant back into a low pressure, low temperature liquid which then goes back to the evaporator where it can now gain the heat again, boil the refrigerant and start the process all over again. So like I said, this part of the system is just the same as what we had in the uh, air to water heat pump. So that is my look at the ground source heat pump and it's ground to water. So hopefully you've liked the video and catch me next Wednesday when I'll tell you what else we've learned on going over to the dark side to become an air source heat pump engineer. Cheers guys.